Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray that you would now open us up to the moving of your Holy Spirit that is here. Open our hearts and our minds, our ears. Let us listen to your word, and as we hear it, let us be convicted by it. Let us respond to it. Let us be open to the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that all of this would be to your glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, the World Cup finished two, to, two, day, two weeks ago today. Now, if you follow the World Cup at all, you were one of over a billion people who watched at least one game of the World Cup. The final alone between Argentina and Germany had over 700 million people watching it. Now, if you follow the World Cup at all, you'll know that one of the top players, in fact, the top player, according to the voting, he got the, the golden boot, meaning he was the best player, is an Argentinian forward named Lionel Messi. Now, Messi, is, he really is one of the top players in the world, fantastic. He just wasn't good enough to carry an entire team to beat Germany. Now, after the World Cup, after losing, he has talked about how absolutely devastated he is. In fact, he has said that there is nothing that can console him, nothing. He's so shattered from this loss that there is just no way that he can see to take a step forward. The reason being is that his whole life, his whole world is wrapped up in being a soccer player. And so this loss at this stage, at this level, when the whole world was looking to him, the whole world of expectation, or at least Argentina, thought that he could carry them and he didn't make it, he's absolutely crushed. Now, not all the players are like this. Not all the top players have this kind of response. Take a look, for example, at Brazil's vice captain, David Luiz. Now, he is one of the top players. He played in Italy. He now plays for Paris Saint-Germain. He's a, a great player. Of course, not quite as good, given the fact that Brazil faced the worst defeat in World Cup history at a semifinal. They lost to Germany in what many said was just a humiliation for Brazil, considering that they were the host country. But here's the thing. Luis is not devastated. Sad? Yep. Disappointed? Sure. But he's not crushed. Now others are trying to project onto him, say, asking him questions like, you must feel so horrible that here you are, in your home country at the World Cup, and you're absolutely devastated, aren't you? And he's like, no. He said, yeah, I'm disappointed, but here's the thing. He's not willing to take on people's projection of their own concerns, of their own issues. No, the reason is, is that Luis is a follower of Jesus Christ. His identity is not wrapped up completely in being a footballer. It's first and foremost in being a follower of Christ. Now that allows him, yes, to enjoy the gift he has been given as being a great soccer player, but he's not consumed by it. His whole identity is not wrapped up into it. It's not that he has to say, this is who I am, and if I lose this, then that's it, that's the end of life, that's the end. He's not willing to take on the definition of others, what others have projected onto him to say, this is who you are. But you know what? The thing is, we all project onto others our own definitions of who we think they should be. We all, in some form of another, place onto others our own fears, our own expectations of who they are. We define them and we put them in a little box, a little safe container, and we say, this is who you are. But someone like Luis says, no, I'm first a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, although we project onto others our own definitions and how we want to contain them and put them in a box, we don't just do that to other people. 
We also do that to God. Consciously or subconsciously, we project onto God our own desires, our own issues, our own things that we want, and we put that onto God to try and defend God that way. We put God into different categories in order to make ourselves feel more comfortable. We project onto God what we want, and then we say, well, isn't it amazing that God actually agrees with me? We already have our views, say, whether it's political or our views on economics or our views on morality or conventional wisdom or whatever it is. We have these views. We put them onto God, and then we're able to say, look it, God agrees with me. But is that what we should be doing, or is it the other way around, of saying, who is God and how do I respond to that? How am I transformed and to respond to who God is according to to scripture. You see, when we project onto God, when we try and say this is who God is and this is how we define God and, and it's amazing how he agrees with us, we are part of what's called, that's a, a theory that's come up, it's called the different Jesus theory. This is a theory that we define Jesus according to what we already think is right, what we already have as our views. So you get different Jesuses, I guess the plural would be Jesus. I. But you've got a, a, a Jesus, and you've got, for example, the, 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 a Jesus like the Republican Jesus. So that Jesus is against tax increases and activist judges. You've got Democrat Jesus, who's against Walmart and Wall Street. You've got open-minded Jesus, who loves you all the time and never asks you to change. We've got suburban Jesus, who tells you to to become the best you that you can be, to reach your full potential and to, to reach for the stars. We've got spirituality Jesus, who rejects church and says, I don't need church, but really I want to find the God within. You've got the good example Jesus even. The Jesus who teaches you just to be good, but let's leave out all the rest. thing is, Jesus can't be confined. Jesus can't be reduced to a list of categories that we find acceptable, that we like, and that we hold. And the reason is, is because Jesus is the son of the living God. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus, as we find in the scriptures, is the one who came, who was born, who walked this earth, who suffered and died and was raised again for each of us. That whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Whoever believes in him will have life in all its fullness. That is the Jesus of the scriptures. He's not just another religious leader. You know, the realization that Jesus is not just another great teacher or another great prophet is made clear, as we heard read in Matthew's gospel, on that mountaintop and what's called the transfiguration. That realization that he's not just another teacher or prophet is made clear when he is transformed in appearance. He physically changes, but he doesn't just change appearance. Jesus actually appears with the prophet Elijah and with Moses. And standing there with these other two Old Testament figures, Peter responds. He responds by saying, in this amazing circumstances, I know what we'll do. We'll build something. Yeah, that's it. We'll build a nice little, you know, container. We'll, we'll, we'll get this all set up, a nice little place, and we'll, we'll build one for Jesus, and we'll build one for Moses, and we'll build one for Elijah, and won't that be great to commemorate this wonderful occasion on this mountaintop? And by doing this, See, because he's building three, he's putting Jesus on equal footing with Moses and Elijah. But the thing is, Peter fails to recognize, and why God literally interrupts him while he's proposing this. This is his worship. This is what he's trying to give. He thinks it's a good thing. He's, he's giving this worship, and God interrupts him because Jesus cannot be compared to any other prophet. Jesus cannot be compared to any other worldly leader. 
There is no comparison. There is no equal footing. So if we can't put Jesus on the same footing, we can't label him and contain him into a box knowing that he's not just like a leader like Moses or another prophet like Elijah, God interrupts him and says, no, stop. Stop doing that. Stop trying to create this and this response. And what does God say to him? He says, this is my son whom I love. Now listen to him, will you? It's a rough translation there, but he's, he's getting Peter's attention. He's saying, listen to him. Listen to my son. Are we listening? Are we listening to Jesus Christ, the son of God, or are we trying to change him into our own version of a nice, safe, comfy Jesus? One that does not ask us to be transformed, but the one that we have transformed into our own kind of likeness. You know, I think that maybe sometimes in our own worship, just as Peter was worshiping, maybe we need to have God interrupt us. Interrupt us right now and say, thanks for this, but this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Because when we listen to living God, we listen to Jesus Christ, we cannot stay the same. We'll change when we actually encounter the living God. Look what happened to the three disciples. When they were there, and when they finally understand that Jesus is God, what do they do in response? They fall flat on their faces, terrified. They're scared. But Jesus doesn't leave them, leave them there. What's amazing is Jesus calls them to get up. He encourages them. He says, get up. And then he says the words that are the most common throughout the whole of Scripture. These words that you will find more often than any other phrase in the whole of the Bible. And Jesus says it to them right here on that mountaintop in the midst of them being terrified, flat on their faces, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He gives them courage to get up, as Jesus says, to respond, to get up and have the courage to change, the courage to follow him. We need that. We need that encouragement, that courage, that, that call to do not be afraid, because we can't do it on our own, but we need the strength and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That courage is something that one man knew very well. It was the courage of a man who died just about two weeks ago. You may have seen about him, read about him. His name is Louis Zemperini. Louis's life was chronicled in the book called Unbroken, which was on the New York Times bestseller list written by Laura Hildebrand. Hildebrand wrote this book because she was inspired when she came across, uh, when she met him. His life has now been made into a movie, which will come out this Christmas, made by Angelina Jolie. Zemperini was an Olympic distance runner. He was also a World War II veteran. During the war, he was flying with his crew looking for a downed B-24 plane. While searching for this plane, their plane crashed, and eight out of the 11 crew died. Zemperini and one other crew member managed to get hold onto a, uh, a, a raft, and they stayed afloat for 47 days in shark-infested waters. They were then picked up. Unfortunately, they were picked up by the Japanese, and he was held as prisoner of war for two years, tortured horrifically, went through pain that is indescribable that the vast majority of us here could never fathom. The thing is that Zemperini's life changed when he got out after the war, and he began to cope in a different way. 
Now, when his death was reported two weeks ago, a lot of the news outlets didn't report this part of it. ESPN put a huge response uh, to Zemperini's death. But they didn't talk about this part that Hildebrand chronicled in her book. And that was, after the war, Zemperini really struggled with PTSD, alcoholism, rage, just anger that came out. But for him, it changed when he went to a Billy Graham crusade. Zemperini accepted Christ as his savior. And, Ze and Hildebrand, who's not a Christian, but she detailed this, and she said this in her book about him. That day that he accepted Christ, she said, he was no longer the worthless, broken, forsaken man that the bird, this is the guy who tortured him more than anybody else, that the bird had striven to make him. In a single, silent moment, his rage, fear, humiliation, and helplessness had fallen away. The morning that he believed, he became a new creation. Friends, we are a new creation because we follow the same Jesus Christ. Now, we talk about that, and we say, I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, or I've said, yes, I commit to following Jesus Christ. Well, what's next? I often get this question in some form or another when people say, ask and, and say, well, I, I'm starting to come to church, I'm, I'm starting to read the scriptures, but what does this transformation look like? What is this next step? How do I deal with this? What is, what is the next step? Well, we're given instruction on what that next step looks like, what this is, is, is uh, what this really looks like by Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, in the first 11 chapters, Paul gives his theological treatise as to here's what I really believe, here's what it's all about, and then here, what we read at the beginning of chapter 12, Paul's giving practical instruction. He says, transformation happens by the renewal of my mind. It all starts here. Now, we often talk about faith as being what we feel. And we express it often in how we feel. And yet Paul is saying here, and he says it in many other places, that it really all starts right here in our thinking. Because what we think translates into our behavior. Now, being renewed by our mind and knowing that there are so many things that fight for the attention of what we think about, Paul knows this. And that's why he says not to be conformed by the world, but to be transformed by the word in our thinking. Now, there's endless research that talks about the correlation between what we see, what we read, what we consume, how that affects our thinking, and how our thinking then dictates our behavior, what we do. University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business professor, a guy named Jonah Berger, prolific writer. Uh, he's an expert on viral marketing. Uh, goes along, he's been on TED Talks and all kinds of things. And he's written a book called Contagious, in which he talks about how the things that affect our thinking affect our behavior. Now, in this book, he talks about triggers. Triggers are subconscious things that affect what we think, and then that affects what we do. Now, Berger gives an example in, uh, in Contagious when he talks about how researchers went into a grocery store. And in the store, they changed out the Muzak, you know, that lovely music that you hear that makes you want to get out of the store. They changed this music, uh, and they did this research where on certain days, they played German music, and on other days, they played French music. Then they looked to see how shoppers changed their behavior. Now, what was fascinating is that on the days the German music was played, there was a spike in the sell, sale of German wine. Not kidding. On the days that they played French music, there was a spike in the purchase of French wine. And this was just one example of many where they said how these subconscious triggers affect what we think, and then what we think affects our behavior. Paul knows that there are many triggers 
that are affecting our behavior, which is why he says, don't conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Don't let these triggers affect you, but listen to Jesus Christ. Listen to Christ saying, get up. Do not be afraid. Follow me. In Colossians, Paul talks about this in a slightly different way. He talks about when he says, be renewed in knowledge according to the image of God who created him. Now, renewed here, in the Greek word, the Greek verb, is a passive verb. So it's not something that we do. We don't renew ourselves. It's something that happens to us. We are renewed, that passive verb. It's, the verb is anakanu, and it means to make new or to make different. Now, Paul's saying here that in order to be made new, in order to be made different, we have to get back to the original. We have to get back to the way that God created us, back to that image of God. Did you catch that? We are renewed by getting back to the way we are created. Back to the image of God. The question is, to get back to the way that we were created, it's a question of, of what all is in here and what has been cluttering our minds and our thinking and, and what we're doing. I think just a couple of weeks ago, my computer finally slowed down for the umpteenth million time with my brand new Windows 8.1, which wasn't supposed to slow down and get cluttered. And shockingly, I couldn't believe it, it actually did, despite what they said. And slowing down, I finally had to reset it back to its factory settings. You know what that means? That means you got to get rid of all the programs you loaded, all the apps that I had on the screen, went all the way back, right back to the beginning. And you know what happened when I did that? It worked. All the stuff that had been cluttering up its memory and its speed, all the stuff, once that was taken off, it got back to working the way it was supposed to be working, not slowed down. Our minds, in a sense, get cluttered over time. They get slower, in a sense, because of all the things that are calling for our attention. And Paul is saying, no, renew your mind. Renew your thinking. Get rid of that clutter and come back to the way that God created us, back to that original intention. So what is that intention? What is God's intention for us? Well, throughout Scripture, God's intention for us from the very beginning to now is to be holy. Now, I say that our intention is to be holy. Immediately, our cluttered minds are going to start thinking holy. Okay, I know what that means. At least for me, the first thing that comes to mind is Saturday Night Live and the church lady. We think holy, you know, and we think, well, I won't do my impression because it's bad. But you think about what that means as holy. We have stereotypical connotations, what this means. And yet that is so far from the biblical understanding of holiness. You see, what we have come to mind stereotypically is holiness that is rooted in behavior. Jesus challenges that idea that holiness is just behavior, that it's just a list of don'ts. He challenges that time and again. Because it's not just about behavior. It's something much more profound than that. Jesus says, you've heard it long ago, do not murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with a brother, you are subject to judgment. You've heard it said before, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that even if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. You see, Jesus is taking this whole idea of holiness, taking it out of this stereotypical view of behavior, and he puts it into the psychological. He puts it into our thinking. He puts it into our minds. Think even the word psychological, psychology, comes from the Greek word, that has to do with soul. That's what Jesus is talking about, our souls, and that is linked up to our thinking, our minds. That's why I think even the word repentance, it actually means to change our mind. It means to change our thinking. It means to change direction. Bringing things together here, I said at the beginning that I was glad 
at the beginning of the service that Pastor Dave had given me the passage on the transfiguration to match with the music that was being so wonderfully played this morning and that theme of transformation. And because I think about how when I was here up until the age of 12 or 13, and joking aside, I was not going on a great direction. By the time I got to high school, I was agnostic. Barely believed a thing. I was really good at conforming to the world, but I wasn't open at all to being transformed by the Holy Spirit. My stereotypical views of the holiness, not going to go near that, not going to touch it. The thing is, I knew a bunch of the Bible stories. I grew up here. I knew them, but I didn't know Jesus. And that's a fundamental difference. We can know, intellectually know, a lot about Jesus, but if we don't know him, it makes no difference. Now for me, it took coming out of surroundings that were familiar, the things to which I was conforming. To me, it took studying, I was an art history major in college, which my dad was really excited about, of the job prospects. But I went to Italy to study for a year, and while there, my classroom were churches. And going in and out of these churches and looking at medieval and renaissance art and looking at these crucifixions and looking at them at that stage at a purely academic level, but what I wasn't seeing were the people there in these pews who were praying. And I remember thinking, what the heck are they doing here? And then seeing these people praying day in and day out and coming to these churches, I started thinking. I started to think what this was all about. I started thinking, what direction am I going? And then I came back here to the States, and I met up with an old roommate of mine, and he had become a Christian while I was gone in that year. And so I did what any natural, normal person would do, and I avoided him. Because I knew that he would be weird and now boring and you know, a nut job. So I avoided him, but he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't stop trying to trail me. And so we got together, and you know what I found out? He was the same guy in the, in the sense that he was funny, but he was different. He was happier. He was content. And he lived a different way and was happier about it. And so we began to read the Bible together, that scary book. We read it together, and he said, just don't take my word for it. Let's read what God has to say about this. And I began, for the first time, to see Jesus. And transformation began to happen. And here's the thing, transformation didn't come like this. It didn't happen overnight, it was a process. And guess what, you know what? It's still happening to this day, this very minute, transformation continues. Because if we ever get to the point of thinking, yep, I arrived, danger. We are transformed continually by the renewing of our minds. So I have to ask myself every morning, asking, am I looking at Jesus Christ? Am I listening to him? Or am I projecting onto him my own views, my own ideas, what makes me feel more comfortable, as opposed to, Lord, transform me? And so as we go from here this morning, I invite you to join in me on a daily basis, asking some of these tough questions. These questions, the things like, what is influencing my thinking? What are those things that really inform my thinking and then as a result, what I do? Am I willing to be transformed by the word of God to praise God? Or am I being conforming to the world to please others? Scary questions, but guess what? If we're really listening... Let's listen to Jesus, the Christ, on that mountaintop. Let's hear the same words that he's saying, that he said to the disciples, that he's saying to us now. Do not be afraid. Get up and follow me. Amen. <clears throat> and thanks be to God.